Uh, this is our second week uh, in this series that we are going through the family of God. The second week that we are exploring what does the Bible say about what it means to be the church. To be the church that God made us to be. What does that look like? Um, to explore that behind the scenes, uh, I, what I am doing to, to sort of develop each of these lessons, I am uh, looking at all the places where the word church, the, the Greek word ekklesia, uh, occurs in the New Testament and seeing how all of those things uh, play out. And so I'm kind of doing a word study to develop this series, and we'll talk about that word here and there throughout the series as well. Last week, um, as we were looking at this, we saw the the very first time the word church appears uh, in the New Testament, in the Bible. It is used by Jesus himself as he is uh, telling his disciples there, he's asking them, what do people, uh, what are people saying about me? And who do you say that I am? And Peter proclaims that you are uh, the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. He says that he will build his church, and we talked about how Jesus is the builder and the owner of the church. He said, I will build my church. It is the hand of Jesus that has brought us together. He has shaped us, and he is building us into the church. He is building us into a temple, uh, that is to say, the dwelling place of of God. We are together where God dwells in this world. Uh, That's what we talked about last week. And by the way, um, on Wednesday nights, if you come back on Wednesday nights, I started this last, uh, last Wednesday, we are um, taking the, the sermon that I gave the Sunday before and using that as the basis of our discussion on Wednesday nights. And so uh, we explore things maybe a little bit deeper, uh, some things that maybe I didn't get a chance to get to in the sermon, uh, probably occasionally some things that I realize I wish I had said better, I can clarify, those kinds of things. But we are using that as our discussion on Wednesday nights. So I'd invite you to come back on Wednesdays to uh, continue that. That discussion. Uh, today, uh, we are taking it a step further and we are exploring as recognizing Jesus as the builder of the church, we are exploring what are these blocks that he is choosing, these, uh, these living stones that he is bringing together to build into the church. It seems like when we look at the stones, the living stones that he chooses to build his church, that is you and me, Uh, He seems like he's making some strange choices sometimes to bring together uh, pieces of the puzzle that don't seem like they would fit together from a worldly perspective. Bringing together and building up an unlikely alliance. Um, I'm sure you saw last week the devastating uh, news of the earthquakes that took place in Turkey and Syria. Uh, just absolutely devastating. There is some really tragic and heartbreaking stories that uh, are coming out of that. And I know that the, the numbers of the, the lives lost is continuing to climb. Um, last I saw approaching, approaching 30,000 people, and it is just absolutely gut-wrenching what has happened over there. As I've been reading about it, though, one of the things that I have been interested to read about that I didn't know about before was the, the relations between Turkey and Greece. Uh, and Turkey and Greece have had a strained relationship for a long time. Uh, they've had territorial disputes. Uh, there's something of a rivalry between the two countries. Um, there have been some uh, real moments of a lot of tension between them and even threats of war uh, between the two countries of Turkey and Greece. In fact, the Turkish foreign minister a couple of years ago um, said this. He said, those who, those who sow the wind reap the storm. If you do not want peace, we will do what is necessary one night suddenly, making reference to Greece. There is real animosity between the two countries. And yet, in the wake of the disaster that we have seen, Greece is one of the countries that has sent aid to Turkey. Uh, They have sent all kinds of supplies, they have helped in the relief efforts, and amid all of this we see some cooperation, and it's a result of an agreement that they reached about 20 years ago, when they both went through another earthquake. 
They reached this agreement that they would provide assistance during times like that to each other regardless of how their political situations were. And I thought that was fascinating that they had this agreement, these two that were at odds with each other, to help each other when things were difficult. It is meaningful when we witness that kind of thing, right? It is meaningful to recognize those who are at odds or who seem like they don't belong in some way together to be brought together, whatever the circumstances. And as Jesus begins to build his church, that's what's happening. He is bringing together those who are at odds with each other in a lot of ways, and he is uniting them in a brand new way. In Acts chapter 11, we get a glimpse of that story beginning to develop. In Acts chapter 11, verse 19, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And what's happening here is, uh, if you remember the story of Stephen, Stephen uh, speaks, speaks the gospel. He tells uh, the story of the Jewish people to the Jewish leaders, and they don't like a lot of what he has to say, and uh, it infuriates them enough that they drag him out and stone him. And as a result of that, it prompts others to begin this wave of persecution against the church that causes the church to spread out from Jerusalem. And they head north into a region uh, here uh, into Antioch, which, uh, as a side note, is right in the area where the earthquakes uh, hit last week, uh, where Antioch is. It's right up in that region. Uh, So the church has spread up into this area, but they are speaking to their own people at first. They're only communicating uh, the message of the gospel right here to the other Jews. And then we see these other people from Cyprus and Cyrene. Cyprus is a large island there um, in the Mediterranean Sea. Cyrene is in the northern part of Africa. And these guys start to speak to the Hellenists, the Greeks, these Gentiles. When this happens, people start turning to the Lord, and the church is growing with Gentile numbers now. And it catches the attention of the church back in Jerusalem, and the church in Jerusalem is like, well, this is straight. Well, you better make sure this is legit. And they send Barnabas up to check on things to make sure it's all good. And he finds, yes, it is good. This is the work of God. The Spirit is moving among Jews and Gentiles. These two that were at odds being brought together, it is genuine, and the church quickly discovers that part of the nature of the church is that the church is an open door to a place for all people to belong. It is an open invitation, a welcome open door for people of all kinds, of all nations, all people to find a family, a place to belong And I don't know if we fully appreciate how truly revolutionary that was in its time. It absolutely was. For most of its history, humanity has been fractured. They have been fractured into groups that generally didn't intermingle except for when one was trying to conquer the other. Like, that's sort of the way that history has been, and and it still is that way in a lot of parts of the world. Um, And even within those groups that were were fractured from each other, there um, there were divisions even within those groups, right? And so they were divided into groups that had different social standing and different economic classes, And when Jesus begins to build his church, the the living stones that he's going to pull from the quarry come from all of these various quarries, right? He's pulling stones from everywhere to build his church. And it was surprising. It was shocking to the people in the first century, the kinds of things that they would see. When God draws Peter um, in Acts chapter 10 to go to go and meet with a Roman centurion. And he finds that God has also drawn that Roman centurion to meet with him. That God has been orchestrating these things for this this Jewish fisherman and this Roman military guy to come together. 
Peter's amazed and he remarks this in Acts chapter 10. He opens his mouth and says, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Like all are welcome. Anybody that fears God and wants to do what he calls them to do, they're welcome to come and join in. Right? That's that, and Peter, Peter is amazed at this. He marvels at what is going on here. When we get to Revelation that begins to, to show John a peek behind the scenes into the heavenly realm of what God has been doing, is doing, and will do later on. Uh, one of the things that John sees is this. Uh, he, he sees uh, the, those who are in heaven, says they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. And look at this. From every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And you see, the, the image that, that John is, is shown is this, this expansive group of people from everywhere, speaking all different languages and brought together in Christ. This is what God is doing. He's bringing together in the church, in the thing that he is building, this massive global, multicultural, unified body of believers. These people who love and serve the one true God together as a strange and wonderful family. This is what God is doing. And when we back up and we just see the scope and the magnitude of what God is doing through time and around the world, it's amazing. He's doing what, what nobody else can do. And when we recognize that, then we zoom back in to our little corner of it, right? And we notice some of the things that we let come between us. The things that we let divide us, don't they start to seem oftentimes rather petty? And I'll come back to that in the next point. Paul says here in Romans 15, 7, he says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you to the glory of God. Welcome one another. How Christ has welcomed you, knowing, knowing all of your own baggage, right? All the things that probably should separate you from God, but because of Christ, they don't anymore. How can we welcome others in the way that Christ welcomes us. The church has a place at the table, a place at the table for literally anyone who loves Jesus and wants to serve him. There is a place at the table for anyone who loves Jesus and wants to serve him. You can try to use your imagination to, to try to peek into the first century scene at the early church gatherings as they would come together in homes and the kinds of people that would be brought together to meet in that place. And they were known for sharing a meal together during their, their meeting time um, and worshiping together and encouraging one another. But you would see, if you walked into that setting, you would see gathered at a table together a Roman soldier. You would see a former slave you would see those who had been uh, Pharisees alongside uh, those who, who, were, who had been senators. You would see all of these people that would be gathered together. You would see uh, Roman soldiers serving slaves, breaking bread together. And we know that the church in Philippi began with a Roman soldier jailer, began with a female wealthy merchant, and began with a little slave girl who had been used for, um, for predicting things for other people with a demonic possession. And these were the people that had come together and started to form the church in Philippi. It's amazing what you might witness there. I was reading through the, like I said, the various places in the New Testament where the word church is used, ecclesia in the Greek. Um, and one of the ones that, caught my attention um, was this one in Acts chapter 13 that, again, back in Antioch, describes 
the people that are there. It says, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a, long, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Uh, and this is where the missionary journeys of Paul begin. Um, this, is, this is, but just right before this, we see this group, this group of Christians here in Antioch together. Um, and they are actually hearing from the Holy Spirit. Like, like I don't know, I don't know how, how the message came through, but they are getting clear instruction of specifically what to do. In response, they're praying and they're fasting together. They're laying on hands and they're sending off, uh, they're sending off Saul and Barnabas on what became this epic first missionary journey that spawned all of these churches that we, uh, we have letters to in the New Testament and all these amazing things. But look who it says is present. Notice this group that is among these prophets and teachers. Barnabas, we know. But Simeon and Lucius, they're both people from Africa. Simeon has a Jewish name. Lucius, that's a Roman name. Then we have what is maybe the most amazing thing to me. Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. The, the way that the, the sentence is structured is intended to let us know. It's saying he grew up with Herod. Like, like they, they had been kids together. They had been raised together. And what the Herod that we're talking about is Herod Antipas. It's the Herod that is mentioned the most in the Gospels. He's the, he's the Herod uh, that had um, John the Baptist executed. Um, he's the, the Herod that spoke with Jesus as they were questioning him before the cross. That Herod, this guy grew up with. I think that's amazing that he is now a part of the church here in Antioch among the prophets and teachers. And let us not get too used to Saul being there. Let's remember who Saul is at this point. Saul had been a persecutor of the church. In fact, Saul had not been trusted completely when he first came among them, and Barnabas had to convince them that he was okay. And Saul is among there. And Saul's being sent off for this work. I think it's an incredible testimony of the, kind, of the kinds of things that happen in the church by the power of God. That in Christ, we are not defined by our differences, but united in our shared faith. And so, again, the church is an open door for all people. All kinds of people. And in church, we are not defined by our differences, but united in our shared faith. It's amazing when you stop and reflect on it, how much we are told to define ourselves by our differences. Like, not just in church, like, like culturally, like everywhere, we, our differences are highlighted and we're told that's, what, that's, that's the thing that's important about you. Now, we have differences, of course, and there, there's a place for those things, and we can appreciate those things. They can be useful, God-given differences, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But if we're in the church, our core identity is in Jesus. Our core identity is in the Christ, the Messiah, the King over all things, and that is what unites us. And so let me say this, and I'm speaking for myself. If you love and you serve Jesus as the Messiah, whatever else we disagree on, I'm going to treat you as a brother and sister in Christ. Now, sure, there can be differences and there can be things we disagree on and there's, there's things that we discuss and we debate, but I believe that we can do that as family rather than as enemies. And so if you believe that Jesus is the Christ and you love and you serve him, then I will treat you as a brother and sister in Christ. Now, as the church spread further into uh, Gentile regions, uh, 
past Antioch as, 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 uh, as Saul and Barnabas went off on their journeys and started to uh, found other churches um, into these Gentile regions, congregations were formed like the one in Colossae. And when Paul wrote back to the church in Colossae, he said, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. It's very, very similar to the passage we read uh, at the start of this from Galatians, which is in a, kind of in the same region as well. All of those labels, all of those identities that the world wants you to hold on to, which are given, they're given the first century examples of those here. In the church, those things don't matter here. They can still be true about you, and they, they still can uh, be the ways that God is working through you, but they do not give you your place, your identity. You are, you are in Christ, and that's what matters here. First and foremost, you are a child of God. You are a child in his household. That's another word that is used sometimes to refer to the church, is God's household. Um, when I was in Israel, one of the things that I learned uh, was the concept of a household. In the context of the small, mostly Jewish communities that were around the, the villages of Galilee, where Jesus spent uh, most of his, uh, of his adult life and did most of his min ministry was in these kinds of communities. Um, and this is a picture from a place called Chorazin. Uh, Chorazin is a place nearby to where Jesus lived in Capernaum. Um, and it is mentioned that Jesus did miracles here. Jesus spent time in this place. And what you see on the screen there, um, this is a housing, a family housing complex. Uh, you can see in the middle of it there, uh, this area here is kind of, a, kind of a central courtyard, and then there's, it's like kind of a U-shape of rooms all around it. Each of, those, each of those rooms is a house for a part of the family. It's where they lived. And as the family grew, that is, as um, one of the sons would get married, they would then add on another room to the end of the house. And so they would go, you know, the, the, they would arrange for the marriage to, to be, and then the groom would go back to his father's house, and he would uh, begin to prepare a place for them. And he'd go to the end of the house, and he'd step off however far he wanted the, the room to be, and then he would set down on the ground the cornerstone. And from that cornerstone, then he would start to build the rest of the house, and that's how it was developed. Um, and you can, you can draw a lot from, from just knowing that, right, uh, in some of the language that is used in the New Testament. In fact, as a side note, this isn't our point today, but as a side note, this was the imagery that Jesus was talking about when he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and it's ready. I'm going to come back and get you. He was going to the Father's house to prepare a place for you as his bride. But as, as the families did this, the families would grow, the household would grow, and the bride that was coming in would now be a part of that household. They would be in that family. They'd be united in this uh, arrangement together. And we are brought into God's family. By the way, this is how a lot of the villages around the Galilee started. They started with a household building their insula, and then it would grow from there. Capernaum, where Jesus lived, um, what, it, what Capernaum means, it's literally in the, in the language, it's Kafar Nahum. Kafar means village, Nahum is a name, okay? Uh, the village of Nahum. And so it started with some guy named Nahum, um, and it was, he was the patriarch of the family, and the village grew out of his household. And that's where Capernaum came from. It was structured just like this, where Jesus lived. And so this is our story as well. When our differences define us, they separate us. We're not part of that. But when we are part of the family, when we are united under Christ, those same differences work together in complementary ways in the household together as a family in his service. That's what Paul is talking about. 1 Corinthians 12. 
He talks about all of our differences, how they come together as a united force. He says, the body doesn't consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts in yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And continues to go on from there. And you see how we, in this talk, and as we talk about the church, necessarily we start to have to mix metaphors a lot here, right? And so we have the family, we have the, the household, we have Jesus building the temple that God dwells in. We have a body that is made up of many members. When I read this, when I read about the way that Paul describes the body coming together, I find it encouraging. Because sometimes I'm like one of those, one of, one of those parts that's like, man, I'm not like that other part. So I, I, don't know if, I don't know how well I belong. Sometimes we can look at the way that someone else is gifted and we can feel disappointed in ourselves, like we're letting the team down because I'm not gifted in the way that they are. Or maybe we can be frustrated by our various personalities and our various perspectives that come together and are different and sometimes challenging and hard to work through and wondering how can we possibly get on the same page. But us being exactly on the same page about every single thing is not really how this works. We are brought together amidst our differences on purpose to function in complementary ways. God has given us various gifts and he has designed us to work together for his purposes. Our unity is found not in us being all the same but using all of our differences in service of the same mission under the same God. And so God has given us these gifts, and um, God willing, if everything goes according to plan this year, uh, I plan to do a series later in the year on our spiritual gifting um, and how we put those to use. But for now, just notice and appreciate that all these different parts of the body are what they are because God has made them that way. And God has assigned them to be that way and to function together. This is the work of God. This is the, this is the spirit at work among us. God has given us these various gifts. And by design, they work together for his purposes. A few passages we'll run through real quick. Romans 12, 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. 1 Corinthians 12, 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. So you see the difference and also the unity. Verse 11, all of these are the work of one of the one and same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. 1 Peter 4, 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. The ways that we are made and brought together are examples of God's grace in its various forms. I love that. And so I praise God. I praise God that you're not like me and that I'm not like you, but that we work together to serve the same Jesus. I think that's awesome. You can imagine that if we ask somebody to uh, paint a mural to decorate the church here. And we asked them to, but we said, okay, uh, we paint a mural on this wall, but we're only going to give you the color red. Right? (laughs) I mean, if they're a good artist, they might be able to come up with something interesting and creative. But how much better would it be if they had the whole palette of colors to work with, right? 
It's, it's the same way. We shouldn't all expect to be exactly the same, but our God is using all of the various colors to paint his picture here. This should be our desire as a church to be joined in harmony with people that we probably never would have been drawn to if not for our commonality in Christ. It's a beautiful thing when it happens. Our natural tendency is to, what do they say, birds of a feather flock together, right? Our natural tendency is to be drawn to people that think and act and do the same things we do and have the same gifts as we do. Um, and those who challenge us, who push back on us, who um, have different gifts from us and different perspectives and different ideas, uh, we keep our distance sometimes from them. That's what it comes naturally. But I'm learning that it's important to forge those connections in Christ all the more when we feel that. Like, like I, I find that those who, who push back on me, who challenge me, who I feel uncomfortable around sometimes even, um, those are the relationships that can glorify Christ the brightest, right? Because they don't come naturally. It is by the power of Jesus that brings us together. Ephesians 4, um, verses 1 through 6. I appreciate Sid shared this in class today. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the, of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all, and in all. Man, Ephesians is such a powerful, powerful book. But notice what he says there, that we are eager to maintain the unity. Eager to do it. Not reluctant. Not like, well, if I have to maintain unity, just go along to get along. No, it is, we are eager. We want to do what we can to maintain unity in the spirit, the bond of peace who we are called to be because it is not just about us, right? He says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And he describes this unity among us, and part of walking in this manner is walking out this unity as part of a calling because it proclaims the gospel in itself. Our relationships with each other, empowered by the Spirit, proclaim our God. Our connections, our relationships, especially the ones that are unlikely and surprising, are so important for the world to see, to recognize that there's something unique in this fellowship that they don't see in other places. People walk away maybe scratching their heads, wondering how can those people be joined together? When the world sees our unlikely alliance, they witness the love and power of Christ. We exist, as I've said, as a temple of God, a place for his very presence. And that's not merely for ourselves, although it is a wonderful blessing. But as a dwelling place of God, we bring his presence into the world. We bring the world around us into connection with him. To mix in another metaphor, that's part of being the priesthood of all believers, right? A priest uh, goes, to, goes to God on behalf of the people and goes to the people on behalf of God. That's part of our role as well in the world. Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper, John 13, 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another by this, by this, the love that you have for one another, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see how he's really emphasizing this, isn't he? The love that you have for one another is how people will know that you are my disciples. Now, that's how they'll know? How, how is that the case? I mean, people love one another all the time, right, that are not in Christ. Obviously, 
this is a different kind of love. It's a kind of love that reflects the, the love of Christ in a way that the world doesn't experience. They say there's something different about that group. The way they treat one another, the way that they love one another, the way that they are, um, they are long-suffering with each other, and they are humble, and they forgive, and they work together even though they're different, and they accomplish things that seem out of their reach. That's because God is working through them. Even among his 12, Jesus brought together unlikely alliances, right? Right? That's maybe a whole other lesson, but you think about the 12 that he brings together. There's uh, a bunch of them are fishermen, but there's also a tax collector, and there's a zealot, people who would have hated each other, but they're brought together under Christ. And going along with him, he, he, he's also supported by uh, several women, including, including one named Joanna. Joanna's husband worked in Herod's household. Amazing, these things keep coming back around. These these unlikely alliances, these unlikely connections, these things that where people show love and care for one another and work together that shows the world the love and the power of Christ. Consider, what does the world see when they look at us as the church? Do they see this power and this love? Or do they see more of the same thing that they see in other parts of the world? Do they see people that love those who love them, and that is all? Or do they see something different? Do they see a strange, barrier-breaking, transformative love full of unlikely alliances? When Paul was imprisoned and uncertain if he would ever see them again, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, saying this, Philippians 1.27, he said, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, whether I get out of jail and get to see you again or I die here, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side, for the faith of the gospel. I, I just, that desire for Paul to hear that that's what's going on in the church, I pray the same thing for us. That we will be people united in one spirit, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So, may the world see the power and the love of Christ in our relationships. In these bonds that defy explanation outside of the power of Christ. May we learn to appreciate our God-given differences and our gifts. And find the ways that God has made them to function together. That will be a a fun discovery. May we be united in him with an open door for all to become part of the family of God. In just a minute, I'm going to read one more passage to conclude. Um, And then after that, we're going to sing a song. Um, And as usual, we'll have our elders uh, at the back of the room, and I'll be back there as well. If you are in need of prayers, uh, if you just want somebody to talk to, or if you are ready to be immersed into Christ, to be baptized, to, to wash away your sins, to become a follower of Jesus and dedicate your life to him, then we have some water that's ready for you too. Um, And so in just a minute, if you have any needs at all, uh, we'll invite you to reach out um, during that song. Let's conclude with these verses. Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. If we can help you today, please reach out as we stand and sing. Since the love of God is shared.